May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's gospel includes the seemingly innocuous request from a group of tourists visiting Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. We know little about these unnamed Greeks who made their appeal to Jesus' disciples. Perhaps they were Jews living in remote places of the known world where Greece once ruled. More likely, however, they were Gentiles, either in the process of converting to Judaism or simply seekers on a spiritual journey. In either case, our text begins with a brisk exchange between these tourists and Philip who in turn talks with Andrew, and who together then approach Jesus with their request. Clearly, Jesus had become well known throughout Israel, the subject of much conversation, consternation, and increasing controversy. No longer just a carpenter's son from the backwaters of Nazareth, or one of any number of itinerant preachers roaming the Galilean countryside, Jesus had become a quite public figure, a true personality. Were the scene set in our own 21st century time, Jesus' face would appear on the cover of every tabloid, his travels and ministry would be chronicled on Facebook and Twitter, and 60 Minutes and Oprah Winfrey would be vying to score an interview with him. So that this morning's Greek tourists wanted to see Jesus comes really as no surprise at all. In fact, the four Gospels are replete with stories of those who shared the same hope. The crowds who gathered for the Sermon on the Mount wanted to see Jesus. The blind man and woman with the dying child wanted to see Jesus. Nicodemus wanted to see Jesus. Let's face it, friends, everybody wanted to see Jesus this prophet, this preacher, this healer. But why? What were they looking for? What's striking in most of the passages which describe those seeking Jesus is the specificity of their agendas. Each person or group has a specific expectation. The crowds, for example, sought the excitement of a new voice and radical message of hope amidst oppression. The blind man and woman sought Jesus' gift of healing. And Nicodemus wanted his questions answered. Interestingly enough, prior to Jesus' resurrection, Simeon may be the only person in the gospel narrative who wanted to see Jesus simply because he was the promised Messiah. In so many ways, our personal experiences mirror theirs. As a child talking with my dad about his service in World War II, he often observed that there are no atheists in foxholes. They want to see Jesus. In our own time, I can only imagine that the doctors, nurses, and staff who every day place themselves in COVID's harm's way want to see Jesus amidst the daily dangers and horrors they encounter. For all those whose jobs and livelihoods have vaporized in this indiscriminate pandemic, I'm sure they too want to see Jesus amidst a world turned so harsh and cruel. And most poignantly, no doubt the family of George Floyd, indeed an entire nation, want to see Jesus in the midst of yet another black man crushed to death other nine minutes of a police officer's knee. A man whose last words were painfully, I can't breathe now. Yes, we do in fact share a specific agenda and specific expectation with those who first saw Jesus. We want concerns addressed. We want problems solved. We want questions answered. The agenda is ours. The expectations are ours. We simply want what we want. Now, this morning's gospel provides no clue 
about what the Greeks wanted in their desire to see Jesus. Perhaps they too had concerns, problems, or questions. Or maybe they simply wanted to be able to tell their friends back home that they had seen him. Something like seeing the president, the pope, or Beyonce. (laughs) We'll never know. In fact, John provides no indication that these tourists ever even got to see Jesus. Rather, upon Philip and Andrew conveying their request to Jesus, he engages them in a private and quite profound conversation. Most striking, however, and distinctively different from the other gospel stories of those seeking to see Jesus, it is not the expectation of the Greeks that are to be addressed. No, friends, this time it is Jesus who sets the agenda. Jesus has something to say to Philip and to Andrew and to you and me. First, he uses a familiar metaphor, a seed, to describe the discipleship of those who serve God. A seed that simply hangs on a plant remains nothing more than that, simply a seed. It bears no fruit and serves no purpose. On the other hand, if it falls to the ground and dies, it bears considerable fruit. More plants, more wheat, more trees. Remember, John is a mystic, and his writing is often cryptic and difficult to understand and apply to our lives. Yet in this case, it seems clear in the context of his whole gospel He's not only recounting Jesus' allusion to his approaching death and resurrection, but reminding his first century audience and us that they and we have been baptized into his death and resurrection and now are called to bear the fruits of discipleship and our new life. That we live out the good news of Jesus, that we touch lives with God's grace, that we bring hope to a confused world is his expectation of us. As I said, Jesus is making it very clear that he, not we, are setting the agenda. And make no mistake, this requires action, ours. Through our baptism, we are given up in our own lives, lived on our own terms for a life to be lived in, with, and through Jesus. So too have we given up the life of the world, lived on its own terms. The action, the ministry to which we are now called, summons us to engage the full presence of Jesus in our lives. And in so doing, we're only then at a point where we can love life and serve in this world. And particularly today, my brothers and sisters, it calls on us to reject this week's papal claim of heterosexual exclusivity in love and marriage, to reject any edict that would diminish the people whom God has created, and to reject the bigotry, the hate, and the fear that too often empower religion, politics, and the life we share. Indeed, in first serving Jesus, in following him, we glorify the God who is his Father and ours. In giving our lives to Jesus, we are equipped and empowered to serve all whose lives we might touch. And in dying to this life and world, we've been reborn for a life that extends throughout all eternity. As I said earlier, we don't get to set the agenda Jesus does. And for that, let us give thanks to God for the journey ahead of us, a journey to the cross, but so much more. Amen.